we we kind of have this this idea of intelligence being the ability to um, problem use language, solve. right? Problem well, yeah. solve, cogitate, right? But it's a different type of intelligence. The thing is, is that some of these birds have the neurons that connect, like ours, to create language. I'll go out there and I'll just look at them and feel them catching their vibration. It is freaking weird. And they will never forget a face. So if you do something wrong to a crow, they will look at you, they will remember your face, and they may even dive bomb you three or four like years later. What is it that connects us with these things? It's always like, how do we like, how do we look at these, how do we look at them in a different way to truly understand who they are? And I think there's where, we, where we're missing out 100% with the research that we do. Remote viewer John Vivanco looked at the praying mantis and man, was the data weird. How has martial arts been influenced by the bug? And that's not the only animal with an interesting and metaphysical consciousness. Crows are unusually smart. What do they remember that you wouldn't expect them to? The Eurasian wryneck might be a bird too, but it sure looks and acts like a snake. What does ancient lore say about owls, birds, curses, witchcraft, secret societies, and aliens? Hear investigative research from Rob Counts and my remote viewing data on this metaphysical podcast that's out of this world. Are you listening to the metaphysical podcast or watching us on a video platform? Leave us a five-star rating and review to help us reach even more people. And like and subscribe wherever you're watching us. John, how you doing? I'm a doing good. I'm glad we're talking about this stuff. This is going to be epic. Yeah, for those of you listening at home, we decided to take a little step back from the weird and, and wondrous world of uh, ancient civilizations and or certain islands like Malta that just have very strange histories. And we decided to dig into something that's a little more human, I guess you could say. But that subject is animals and the strange and amazing mysteries revolving them. I mean, I get why scientists are fascinated with animals. You can learn so much and maybe even how to understand humans better just by studying them. Not that you can equate animals with humans. That's not what I mean necessarily, but more just there are many things that we don't understand about animals that i mean they're incredible yeah you know that like the 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 human benchmark that we place up against understanding animals i i constantly see science fighting against this human benchmark it's like it's an animal because it's not human right so and and we apply our own ways of thinking and how we go about things and our understandings to what they are and how they do things sort of in a somewhat anthropomorphizing them which actually stunts the understanding of them and and i think by by studying certain animals we can come to a better understanding of what memory really is and and we'll be getting into more of that in this episode you guys but there are just so many fascinating things that we've come across uh, and massive reveals. John and his team have remote viewed some of this stuff, and we're going to reveal more about animals as we go on. I think some of the most fascinating animals that I came across are uh, elephants, of course, are, are one of them. Um, the platypus is fascinating. Um, the platypus is like a, the Terminator animal. It really, yeah, it's like it's this it's it's out of myth, straight out of myth, like they were the cryptids of old. No one believed right. things existed. <laughs> right. right. And then I don't know if you've ever heard of planarian 
worms. No, I got to hear about this one. The plenary on worms. Yeah, when I when man when I get into the head, like some of the stuff that's revealed in the study of these things could change how we view human history. I mean, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. But we're probably going to start. Um, a couple of months ago, we had a, a, a rather viral video on on crows and bartering with birds like ravens or crows. Um, and I think a lot of people think that this intelligence in ravens and crows is limited to ravens and crows, like they're separate among their species of avians, you know. Um, but what I found through my research is that you know, for a while I was always like, ah, look at that loser over there. He's bird watching, you know, like they, like so many people have hobbies where they just bird watch, but I get why they do it now. Like I'm starting to understand why people are bird watching, because if you bird watch, your mind will consistently be blown at what you're watching, how they're communicating, what they do with one another, how smart they actually are. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I mean, bird watching is actually an obsession. Like I'll go out and watch birds because you it, will. It's, like, it's like a vibration. It's, it's what it feels like to me. Like personally, it feels like there's a vibration within that construct of species that I'm trying to understand, trying to figure out. Like everything's vibration. Everything is energy. And so you have to ask yourself, what sort of energy do they hold? Do they interact with? Do they put out? And beginning to feel their, what that vibration is. And the vibration has like boatloads of intelligence in it, but not intelligence in the way that we think about intelligence. We, we kind of have this, this idea of intelligence being the ability to... Um, Problem solve. language, right? Problem well, yeah. solve, cogitate, right? But it's a different type of intelligence. The thing is, is that some of these birds have the neurons that connect like ours to create language and create, cre I mean, you know, we've got, we've got birds like the African gray and parrots in general who can, who they say, scientists say mimic human language. It's not necessarily mimicking because they've got the neurons to connect concepts together, right? So they're, they're, they're there with us, but see, it goes also beyond that. It goes mm. beyond that. And it, it has to do with the structure of consciousness, the way consciousness is structured within that individual being within the, the that, that species of being it's structured in a different way. And when we apply this idea of intelligence to animals, we're limiting ourselves from understanding the full scope of the structure of their consciousness and truly how to communicate with them. Yeah, it just by based on what you described, it almost sounds like in trying to understand the outside world and in the creation that's around us, we humans get in their own way. Right. Yeah, like we get in our own way because we have too many notions about how things should be, what right. science tells us is possible, what other people think is possible. But then you only really, I mean, that explains bird watching right there. It's like you get into this like flow zone where you're, where you're watching other creatures interact and it changes you. They right. train you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, okay. So like this, have you ever, uh, I've got all these praying mantis in my front yard right now. It's like fall brings out praying mantis for some reason. And I'll go out there and I'll just look at them and feel them catching their vibration. It is freaking weird. It is weird, man. Their vibration is so different than ours. And you can feel that they have this like etheric communication that is going on constantly. It's though they're reading stuff from everywhere through these waves of energy around them and even outside of their, their local area, even almost as though they're receiving transmissions. It's very bizarre. If you ever get a chance to do that, just quiet your mind, go outside and <clears throat> feel, feel these beings because they are connected up in a way that 
is very bizarre. So much so that we've done like remote viewing projects on these guys. <laughs> wow. Okay, so you know one of the one of the gateways into um, praying mantis, I guess, was I was just so curious why the Chinese had developed a style in martial arts around <laughs> praying mantis, right? Because because the more that I study ancient Chinese culture, the more that I've realized that they were they were like the the OGs of just observing nature. Right. Like they were observers. They were amazing observers of nature and they would figure out problems in themselves because everything around them was created by divinity. So it was put there for them to learn and to then take it upon and improve whatever it was that they could, right? So according to the legend, um, this style originated in the late Ming dynasty and early Qing dynasty. Yeah, so we we kind of started off here, you guys, talking about um, crows and 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 ravens and how smart they are. They are. There are, you know, people often think parrots are the only things that can talk, right? But crows, you can train a crow to talk. Now, most crows don't like to be handled or touched, but if you get one in the right conditions, they will make friends with humans and then even start to speak the way that a parrot does, which to me is very interesting, especially if that an art is created around this because their memories are incredible. They never, I mean, think about it. We're talking about a seven year lifespan. So their hearts are beating much faster than ours. Time is relatively sped up for these creatures and they will never forget a face. So if you do something wrong to a crow, they will look at you, they will remember your face, and they may even dive bomb you three or four like years later. And they'll even tell their friends. They will tell their <laughs> they will tell their friends. They will actually tell their friends. This is this is a thing. And then then everybody knows that dude is bad. Stay away from this guy. And you might get into some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy stuff. I yeah. I did not know that before I started looking into this. Now, They'll bring you money too. What are those videos? You saw those videos of crows bringing people money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trying to bring you money. You can, uh, like, reportedly or allegedly, you can barter with birds. Right. This was what this viral video that we had was all about, was where if 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 they learn what is valuable to you, they will bring you back a certain thing in response to you giving them food or doing something for them. This is not, these are not normal bird brain beings. I think when people think of bird brains, they're thinking of ostriches mostly, which is probably true. But when we're talking about other avians of the smaller sort, not the case. I mean, these are very much more intelligent than I think humans were giving them, you know, credit for. Ravens also are smart enough to mimic the howl of a wolf to bring them potential prey. So the wolf will come, they'll hear the howl, the wolf will come and, and kill the thing that the raven wants them to kill, and then they'll eat what's left on the bones after. <laughs> that is crazy. That's a thing. Yeah, that's, that's insane. Not, yeah. That's not dumb. And I mean, it makes sense then why birds can replicate the sound of other things. Right. I mean... We're talking about highly intelligent creatures that are then finding what's what they need and then using nature to bring it to them. Right. Right. Well, you know, it's like I've heard mockingbirds mimic the sound of a train. Like, <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. And or alarms or right. cars, engines. Yeah, car like alarms. Car, engines. car alarms are big with mockingbirds. Well, but if you think about it for a minute here, like see all the crows around the wolf there? I never really I never really thought are those ravens actually, excuse me. I never really thought about this, but it would have to the ravens or the crows in this case ravens would have to be observing wolves long enough to know that they communicate by howling with one another and that the wolves will communicate with one another to a to like alert one another of prey. So they're watching all of this from trees. And then they're like, hey, I want 
my buddy over here that I'm working with to kill this thing so I can get a meal. Right. Th There's... Think about how much intelligence would go into that. Right. Yeah. That's that's uh, human level. That's how this is what scientists want to see, want to find. But but see, like if you get so caught up in that, you forget, you negate this. It's not that you forget, you just negate this other experience because you're always placing it up against this benchmark of, wow, they're doing what humans do. They're smart. But but that's not what it is. I don't think humans are smart because they do that. It's just a thing that humans do in order to survive. What is it that connects us with these things? It's always like, how do we like, how do we look at these? How do we look at them in a different way to truly understand who they are? And I think there's where we, where we're missing out a hundred percent with the research that we do, but see, then this gets into, wow, those are just untested ways to do things. You know, you can't like use your intuition to come up with, you know, uh, anything cogent on this kind of stuff because that intuition doesn't exist to begin with. Right. But, but animals don't live in a world of, if you look at Alfred Korzybski's, so he created general semantics back in the 1930s. And if you look at what he calls the structural differential, he, he pretty much maps out the, uh, the, a little bit of the consciousness structure, the way humans perceive things and, and, and go into language versus the way animals do. Animals exist in the subconscious, what we would consider the subconscious. They have some language building capability, but, yeah. but since, since they have a, a more aware and adept, they're more aware and adept on the subconscious side, they have the ability to sense and feel things deeper than we would and to be able to communicate from that subconscious side. And that's what humans neglect. That's what humans believe does not exist. But yet, if you go into that, you get into a whole different world of understanding. Okay, yeah. So have you, John, have you ever heard of of one of the more strange birds that I've ever seen or heard about is this thing called a Eurasian wryneck? No, I haven't heard of that one. So if you can believe it, it's a member of the woodpecker family. But honestly, to me, it looks more of like a sparrow like i it's very looks like small and compact it, this thing pretends to be a snake when threatened in so though there's people that have bird watched this thing right and you can find this in in the uk and stuff and and basically um there's not many sightings of this thing in britain annually it's basically it's basically sparrow sized and it feeds on ants uh, and nests in holes and trees and stuff like other birds, right? Uh, and when threatened, it has the ability to listen to this: turn its head 180 degrees, like horror movie <laughs> style. It's like Exorcist. And, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like the Exorcist bird. So it'll it'll turn its neck and it'll hiss like a snake. And it is it's nicknamed Snake Bird because of this behavior. But if you look at it, it even has like the same type of patterns that a snake has on it. It almost has, I don't know what you want to call it, like developed into this species that emulates a snake um, in what it does. Now, it this particular bird has often been linked to witchcraft, curses, evil spells, like you name it. And um, its Latin name is Jinx Torquia. And it's supposed to jinx people. Like if you see it, it's a bad omen. It'll bring you bad luck. Look at this thing. Oh, that's crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. Oh, this reminds me of the um, the birds that, or the Japanese. The, are they Japanese owls? I think I'm thinking they're Japanese owls because I saw them on some weird Japanese talk show, which are very strange in and of themselves. But there, there was... Uh, they were they were exhibiting these owls on a show that were like transformer owls. They completely changed the way they looked a hundred percent. Some of them like turned into almost looking like demons. Have you seen Whoa. these things? No. Like 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 this is a whole other weird realm of of animals how they can transform themselves like this bird into these scary looking things that will chase off predators. Oh, yeah, wow. there you go. <laughs> That's so different. Like the thing on the, okay, so I imagine it's, it's normal form is on the left 
and it's Beelzebub form is on the right there. If you're looking at your screen, I mean, this is, <laughs> it literally looks like it transformed into Satan. Right. It's insane. Yeah. It almost looks like a goat. Look at that thing. I know. Look at it. That's crazy. Look at the size of its talons. Man, owls freak me out. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Like, you know, the hooing or whatever. Owls are freaky, crazy yeah. predators. I mean, not many things in the wild lose to an owl. You know. I mean, wind beat an owl is what I meant. Like, owls right. do not lose to many things in the wild. Right. They don't. And then you have the like the the symbology around owls with the Illumidonkeys. And and right. then you have it also with gray aliens, like, oh, I saw an owl tonight and then I had missing time. Yeah. Yeah, there's been so much bizarre occult worship around owls. I mean, right. Why owls? I mean, we're we're looking at a st strange cults worshiping owls right. throughout history. <laughs> right? It's it's weird. Like, why? And I understand, okay, we're talking about if you're gonna take on the characteristics of another being, would the thinking be well, take on the characteristics of an apex predator, because the owls in many scenarios are apex predators. Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, I think I wish more people were adept in the like the history of symbolism, because I feel like a lot of people are very naive with symbolism and what it what it means and what it has meant historically. And I don't I'm not saying everyone needs to know this, but it does appear rather naive to me that people would not learn more about the history of symbols and what they actually mean, because it's a large part of our, of our culture and our civilization. And what I mean by that, I think is, I mean, for myself, okay, what I've, what I've realized over time is that symbolism is sort of a okay i'm a type i'm a i'm a graphic designer i'm a typographer for instance right uh, i deal with almost bringing up history to people to remind them of something to get or bring out some types of feelings in the people that look at my designs. And the only way to really do that is to understand the history of a certain time and the symbols that come along with it. Like there's a big difference between 1920 Art Deco design, which you'll see all over Manhattan, for instance, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. Uh, it brings up feelings of the different parties that they were having at the time. These sort of like flappers and, and you know, these women with short curly hair you know, the types of hats that they were wearing. I mean, even um, sequins, sequin dresses, like all of these things came from that era. And if you want people to feel like they belong in Manhattan, sometimes you will use an art deco style in order to bring out all of these feelings from you because it's all over the city, right? That's a perfect example, I think, of like how understanding history will help, will help us communicate with one another. And we've got all of these symbols from history that people have been using and no one, everyone is just almost immune to it. They're not aware of it. They don't understand it, where it comes from. And some of these things are very ancient. They go back, you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of years to times that are much more difficult to research. And the owl is one of these symbols, you know, the, the owl and these different s shapes that, that, that seem to um, mirror an owl, um, even pentagrams and things like that. Now, I'm not saying there's always a direct correlation there. Um, you know, this is not, I'm not trying to tell anyone at home their business, so to speak, on, on what, what something means. But it is a little bit naive sometimes when I see people using the symbol of an owl and all it's supposed to mean is wisdom. Like you'll, you'll get a lot of older people today, like people in their, you know, sixties or whatever. The only thing that they're aware of is that, you know, the symbol, it, like the owl is a symbol of, of wisdom, of some type of wisdom, which I'm not saying is wrong, but 
I think it is dangerous to put that out there in some form of ad without understanding the occult side of that, because then what are you communicating to people? You know, right. especially people that know more about this, you may be saying something unintentionally that you don't even know you're saying. And that's where it gets right. kind of dangerous, right? Right, right. Yes, the, the, the symbology is really interesting when it comes to this world and the the kind of portals of energy that symbology creates, especially when we wear that kind of symbology on our clothes, can have an impact energetically on, on us, on our lives, what we do, how we react to things, um, whether we have spiritual goals or not. Some can be uplifting and some can be downgrading. And a lot of the popular culture these days, it's downgrading. The symbology is downgrading in a sense to bring in a lower vibrational source of energy to us. You know, um, when people wear logos <laughs> on their clothes, yeah. some of these logos are directly related to things that you, you really don't want to get involved with, but Not people think it's cool. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to wear that logo on my clothes, but it's a very negative vibration that's flowing into you because it creates an opening, a window, a portal. And, and if you don't at home believe what John's saying right now, do some research on how the peace symbol was developed. It's a perfect example of exactly what John was saying. The peace symbol was developed as a almost a guy hanging upside down dead. And this, this was the peace symbol. Like this is the that guy. Was the that was the origination point of it, right? Yeah, yeah. that was the intention origination point. And you, like, you have to look these things up to understand what these things mean. Otherwise, you are you're swimming in a sea of just muddle headedness and you don't even know what something is or where it came from. I right. mean, and, and it goes with any symbol out there, even even symbols that people take now as being these positive things. Um, oftentimes, if you look into their source, it's not always great. And then the question is, well, does it carry the vibration of its origin point? I would have right. to say, yes, it does. You know, matter and mind are very much one thing. You know, it's, it, it is a, it's a very strange world we live in. And, uh, you know, the more energy you put into educating yourself on these things, the better it is, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. It, it, it rises you above the chaff here and, and you become discerning on what energy you do connect with. And yeah. that's really what's important here because we're living, we're living in a realm at this point in time where things are are waiting through mass media towards the lower like i guess you could just say lower astral realm right this this whole this whole place that we exist within here is 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 between two areas it's between the lower astral and the higher planes and we have a choice to go down or to go up and and the intention behind all, many of these symbols that show up in popular culture and mass media is to drag it downward because there is, it's the, it's the ancient battle. It's, it's, it's the ancient battle that comes from the Bible. It comes from all different sources. This area that we are in is the fulcrum point. We can choose which direction to go. There are no gray areas anymore is what it feels like. To me. It does feel like that now. And, uh, I don't, you're I either going to go down or up. You're either going to go down or up and, you know, it's important to have the right intentions there. We'll just say there's a lot we could go into after you just said that, that I, I am yeah. not going to go there. <laughs> I know. But yeah, yeah, very, very interesting conversation. So, um, you know, and, and, and it kind of comes back to like when we're talking about symbols or anything else, like what effects it has on the human body. Well, the question then is too, is like, well, what, what lasting effects do memories have on the human body and or on our species as a whole. And I'll tell you that one of the most interesting things that we've come across are, is the study of planarians, which are worms. <laughs> is that really the most interesting thing? Wait till I tell you this. It is, right. It's almost as wild as Dr. Emoto's research on water. Oh, that's how right. crazy, that's at the level that this is. 